ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Thousands of years ago, in ancient Mesopotamia, someone, we don't know who, began to chisel out an epic tale on a clay tablet. And the opening line of this tale was, there was a man who saw the deep, the bedrock of the land. And this was the story of a king called Gilgamesh, a king who was two-thirds a god and one-third human, and he was said to be 18 foot tall. The Epic of Gilgamesh is thought to be the oldest surviving work of literature in the whole world. It was passed on for a thousand years, and then it became lost until it was rediscovered in the ruins of ancient Nineveh in the 19th century. Archaeologists and linguists translated the story with growing excitement because the Epic of Gilgamesh is wild. Gilgamesh starts out as a vicious tyrant, and so the gods create a wild man called Enkidu to tame him. But Enkidu has sex for two weeks with a sacred prostitute, and in the process, the wild man becomes civilised. Enkidu takes on Gilgamesh in a wrestling match, and the two become friends and lovers. Together they enter a forest to fight a monster, and then they kill the bull of heaven. After Enkidu dies a lingering death, Gilgamesh is stricken with existential terror. So he goes on a quest to find the only survivor of the great flood. Yes, (laughs) that great flood. So he can learn how to live forever. Louise Pryke is back on Conversations today. Louise is an academic at the University of Sydney and she specialises in history. And Louise has long been obsessed with the Epic of Gilgamesh. She's the author of a book on the subject and she's one of very few people in the world who actually knows how to read the story in cuneiform, the language in which this impossibly ancient story was written. Welcome back, Louise. Well, thank you. It's nice to be here. When did you first encounter the epic? Uh, Look, I think I was a a young undergrad at the University of Sydney. And I was very fortunate that my PhD supervisor, Dr. Noel Weeks, was fascinated with the Gilgamesh epic. Uh, But it wasn't until I started investigating the role of Ishtar, goddess of love and war and transformation in the epic, that I started to get really hooked. How did it affect you emotionally to read it? Uh... I was intrigued and I was excited because I started to see that the way that Ishtar was presented in the text, I could see there was humour, there was sophistication and there was wisdom. And I felt like this is a text that is really in many ways kind of the foundational text for my field, which is Assyriology, the study of the ancient Near East, areas of um, sort of Mesopotamia, kind of modern Iraq. Um, It's the foundational text and yet... There is so much there that we have not even scratched the surface. It's so old. It's older than the Bible. It's old, old beyond belief. I think that's the part of the appeal for me is the dizzying sense of its ancientness and the fact that it's the first thing of its kind or seems to be the first thing of its kind. Mm. And what's amazing to me in all of that antiquity is, okay, so it's 4,000 years old, but yet... Even in the earlier versions, it's so sophisticated. The way that they use language, um, the ideas and some of the meditations about life and the human condition, this is like cutting-edge stuff, even in the 21st century. So we don't really know much about its origins. What can we assume or presume about how this story came to be? It's a good question. So, again, we are kind of speculating because, as you say, we don't really have the context. And all of the evidence that we're dealing with is usually fragmented. Uh, it's usually incomplete. But it talks about an early king, Gilgamesh. And Gilgamesh does appear on a um, text known as the Sumerian King List. But the Sumerian King List, even though it does feature some historical kings... It also features people earlier on that we think are probably like more legendary figures. They live hundreds of years uh, and some of them are kind of sages and so forth. And also the Sumerian king list kind of changes depending on which version you're looking at. So it's not exactly a great source the way we like to think of it in the modern day. 
You know, the great Icelandic saga writer Snorri Sturluson always had this theory, you know, he's writing in the 13th century, he said, we can imagine the stories of Odin and the like to come from story, some story of a great warrior or a great leader who brings about some kind of small golden age, who then dies, people come to the great man's grave to pray and then ask for things and then the veneration increases and over time they become transfigured into these divine figures. Perhaps this is what happened to Gilgamesh. He might have been a real person, a warrior or a king who mm. then emerges as this godlike warrior tyrant king. Yeah, I love that. And I think that that's probably very true. People are always asking me, do I think that Gilgamesh was really historical? And I always say, I think there's a little kernel of history in there um, because the rest of the epic is so deft at mingling historical reality with complete supernatural fantasy. And so I feel like why not have the same thing in the figure of Gilgamesh himself? The story is written in the world's oldest written language, cuneiform. And you can read cuneiform? What does it look like? So um, I had to learn cuneiform as an undergraduate and my PhD was in the Amarna letters, which are written in cuneiform. So that's correspondence between Egyptian pharaohs and their Canaanite vassals because the Canaanite language, the Amarna Canaanite language was written in cuneiform, which was the lingua franca for like 3,000 years in the ancient Near East. Right, the common language that was used right across that area. Common language, yes. It was hugely influential. I have heard people describe cuneiform as being the language of the first half of recorded history. <laughs> oh, it's been around that long? Yeah. And so, yeah, so cuneiform looks like, as you said before, it's inscribed on clay tablets uh, using a reed stylus. And it basically looks like you've got a chicken and while your tablet was drying, it's just walked back and forth on it a lot of times because <laughs> <laughs> it's got like little tiny triangles and little tiny lines. So could people have mistaken that for decoration or something? People literally the day? did mistake it for decoration for like hundreds of years. Thomas Hyde, uh, a professor from Oxford, was the person who came up with the name. I think it was around 1700. He wanted to call it arrow writing for a while, but then they came up with cuneiform coming from the Latin meaning uh, wedge-shaped. What have blind people told you about cuneiform? The amazing thing about cuneiform that makes it a little tricky to learn is that the signs are polyphonous. What they, does that mean? It means that they can, well, most of the signs can be read a bunch of different ways. So you can have the same sign uh, that could either be read as, say, she, or it could be read as limb. And context is going to tell you which way to go. But to make it more exciting, sometimes it will be a whole word. Or sometimes it'll be like a determinative telling you the next word is a profession or a place or a god. And so it's really a puzzle how it all fits together. And I have heard people who read Braille saying that Braille is very similar, that it also has this amazing puzzle-like quality and a polyphonous quality to the characters. Depending on where the dots are placed, the sign can mean a whole different thing. And the really fun thing about this as well is that if you think about cuneiform, unlike if you've got, say, something written on papyrus uh, that's written in ink, cuneiform is very tactile because it's 3D. It's been actually physically imprinted. And so uh, I've heard that if you somehow manage to invert that, you could sort of run your fingers along it a little bit. Oh. Like <laughs> amazing. It's a tactile language. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you know, for a long while, people couldn't translate the Egyptian hieroglyphs and they thought that mm. they were decorative as well. And then, of course, eventually the Rosetta Stone appeared that allowed people to translate it because they, they saw the same bit of hieroglyphic text alongside ancient Greek and so they could translate it. Was there a similar thing for cuneiform? Yes. So cuneiform, you know, having been this hugely influential script for thousands of years, suddenly disappears around about the first century Common Era and people actually just forgot how to read it or that it was even a script. And so it sort of lies dormant. But then in around 1835, Henry Rawlinson is in Western Iraq. He's training the Shah's troops at the time. But he starts to look around the area and he sees this monument that was written by Darius I. Uh, what, the great Persian king? The great Persian king, yes. Wow. So he sees this inscription and, again, it's a trilingual inscription. It's in Elamite, Babylonian and Old Persian. Nobody can read any of those languages. <laughs> and so he manages, and the other thing did I mention is that it was inscribed by Darius, as whoever writes things for Darius, um, 100 metres up a cliff face. 
And so what he needs to then... <laughs> How does he get 100 metres up a cliff face? Well, I had read that he had a really long ladder. <laughs> um, but then I was reading the other day that actually he was a really good climber and sometimes he would use nothing and just scale the cliff and get up there because apparently when Darius uh, had the inscription written, he had the ledge removed afterwards so that nobody could in any way interfere with it. Oh. And so it was a bit tricky to get to. But he, um, Rawlinson and a young um, a young Kurdish boy, whose name has been lost to history, unfortunately, uh, they would climb up there. And apparently to get to the Elamite part of the inscriptions, they would have to stick pegs into the rock and like kind of swing across. This is very Indiana Jones, all <laughs> <It's>, of this. <laughs> yes. And apparently it took like quite a while to get the inscriptions. So <laughs> yes, it was quite an endeavour and it was amazing that nobody was injured. Um, but then, yes, yeah, so then he took the inscriptions home and he started trying to translate them along with a couple of other uh, scholars. And they kind of got to the point where they thought they'd cracked it. And you're thinking, how did they even have the faintest idea? But they had noticed that there seemed to be repeated words. And because of these repeated words, they sort of started to realise that what they might be looking at was a king list. And because they knew the context, which was Darius, they were able to use uh, names of people in Herodotus's histories as a way of as giving some context to what they were reading. Right, so Herodotus was the Rosetta Stone in that sense. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Uh, and so they thought that they had managed to translate it, but there were people saying, no, you haven't. And there were also people who weren't convinced that cuneiform was as complicated as it seemed. Some people had the view that the Assyrians wouldn't have been capable of understanding such a complex script unfortunately, how wrong they were. Um, and so then they decided to have a competition and the British Royal Asiatic Society sent out unseen texts to four different scholars. Uh, I think one of them was Rawlinson's um, great rival was one of the scholars. And they had to, in secret, give their full translation, seal them up in an envelope and then send them back. And then a panel would compare them. And if they were close enough, they'd say, okay, we've done this. So they did it, they looked at them and they were like, it's close enough, cuneiform is translated. So then how were the first tablets telling the tale of Gilgamesh found? So Gilgamesh kind of survives in a bunch of different versions, uh, but the most influential version is known as the standard Babylonian version. And the tablets that are associated with that were largely found, as you were saying before, at, uh, in the remains of Nineveh in the library, the great library of Ashurbanipal. And so Ashurbanipal is this amazing Assyrian king and he kind of presents himself as being like a poet king and a scholar. He sends out letters all throughout his empire saying, send me your best stories because I'm creating this library. And so people just send him his stories. Why? Well, because he asked them nicely, but also because he was known for being particularly cruel to his enemies. There's this amazing artwork where he is sitting in the garden having a lovely lunch with his wife and in the trees are the heads of his enemies. Right. Okay. <laughs> so people just give him whatever he wants. And because of that, he has this amazing library with like over 30,000 cuneiform tablets. Uh, I and, think, and what state was this library in when it was found? And what state were the tablets in? Were they all shattered and broken or was it intact? The palace itself was destroyed. But because the thing about cuneiform tablets is because they're on clay, if you set them on fire, it really just makes them fairly indestructible. Right. Um, and so, yeah, so it was just a big mess. It was all over the place. Uh, but the historian and diplomat Austin Henry Layard and the amazing uh, Assyrian archaeologist Homuz Rassam uh, and together they were able to discover this library and uh, it was Rassam who actually found the tablets containing the Epic of Gilgamesh, which were then transported back to the British Museum and this was around the 1850s or so, so cuneiform was still just being figured out. And so they sent it to the British Museum and there they found a home with the self-taught cuneiform scholar George Smith. And George Smith in 1872 was looking at one of the tablets and he realised that what he was reading was a Babylonian account of a great flood with amazing parallels to the biblical account. This is the Victorian age? Yes. Uh, perhaps a, a much more Christian era than the one we're living in now. Mm. Uh, 
What kind of excitement did that create in this man's breast when he realised he was reading an, uh, an account of a great flood that was older than the book of Genesis? He was extremely excited. Um, it is said, although it may be apocryphal, that he was so excited, in fact, that he started to rip off all his clothes and run through the British Museum. Which one of us has not done that in excitement? The way he's I'm running still, around the British Museum with no clothes on still, when we get excited. I mean, we've all done that once or twice, surely. I guess so. I still think it's a really good discovery when one starts to rip off one's clothes. <laughs> um, I have heard it say that he might have been imitating Archimedes, Archimedes uh, yeah. when he runs around shouting Eureka. Um, out of his bath, yes. Out of his bath. But mm. I've heard that they might, that might also be apocryphal. It probably we don't... is too. What about uh, when, once the story got out to the European world or the wider world that there's an account of, of the flood that resembles the flood of Genesis in this very old account? It had a sensational effect. And so they had a big gathering at the British Museum. The British Prime Minister, William Gladstone, came uh, and they presented their findings. And it was front page news that uh, this story had come to pass that looked like it could be actually documenting the flood event described in the Bible. The fact that I think that one of the very first things that was translated in cuneiform in 1872 had such strong biblical parallels really ignited the field of Assyriology and got people really interested in this area of study in a way that I think otherwise might not have ever happened. So this epic story that had been lost to the world for thousands of years suddenly is available to the world again and people can start to read it. What effect does it have in the world in the 19th and 20th century when people can encounter this impossibly odd story? At first, as you say, there was a lot of excitement, but then people got a little bit worried. The whole understanding of the ancient Near East was pretty much predicated on the Hebrew Bible at the time. And so suddenly there were all these sources that firstly seemed to be agreeing with the Hebrew Bible, but then in other ways seemed to be kind of competing with the Hebrew Bible, particularly in terms of things like antiquity. And sometimes the stories didn't exactly align as much as people would have liked. And so there became this whole Bible versus Babel controversy where some people were saying, this is wonderful, this gives us so much context for biblical stories, we need to know more about this. And other people were saying, this is terrible, this stuff is heretical. <laughs> there was actually this story about Nathaniel Schmidt who was teaching at the Colgate University in 1895 some of his translations of cuneiform, they felt, seemed to run a little contrary to biblical teachings and he ended up actually losing his job and going on trial for heresy. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> wow. E even in that late day and age? Even in that late day and age. He ended up working at Cornell, so I think it worked out okay. So over time, as more fragments and more versions of the story appear, people are able to put together a more complete version of this epic story. Who is this King Gilgamesh at the start of the Epic of Gilgamesh, Louise? Right, so in Tablet 1 we meet Gilgamesh, the great king, and there's a prologue where he's described as being perfect in his beauty. I think the text actually says that by human standards he was very good looking, which sounds like a little bit of an insult <laughs> to humans, but I think they just mean compared to gods who are obviously especially good looking. Uh, he's 18 foot tall. 18 he, foot tall. He's six foot wide. He, you know, he's just more capable than all other humans. Uh, he's apparently very wise, but then the rest of the epic makes you question how accurate that description well, is. Well, I was going to ask you about that because it seems like at the beginning of the epic he has a lot of wisdom, uh, mm. knowledge, but mm. not much wisdom because they say he knows the deep, he knows all that what's under the bedrock, he knows all these things. It seems yeah. like he has all these facts at his hand, but he's not very wise. No, you're so right. So at the beginning of the prologue, the very first lines, the incipit, is Shan Nakba Mimuru, which is he who saw the deep. But you can translate the deep so many ways uh, and it could be related to the Apsu, which is where um, the god of wisdom, Ea, is said to live and his groundwaters are said to sort of rise and make everything fertile in ancient Mesopotamia. But Gilgamesh, yes, he does have a lot of knowledge, but it takes him right to the end of the epic to really start to understand where he fits into the grand order of things. He's said to be two-thirds god and one third human. Now, this really intrigues me, Louise, because it <laughs> implies he has three parents, doesn't it? Yes, I should say that no one has ever quite figured out the maths of the two third God, one third man equation. Um, I do like it, though. Um, I like the fact that it's two thirds because um, Mesopotamian gods have sacred numbers, and the sacred number for the God of Wisdom is, well, it's 40, but if you're using a sex edition, just some sex. Sexagesimal, can I say that? I don't know, I can't. 
<laughs> if you're using a base 60 style right. of maths, as they are, uh, then 40 is two thirds, right? And so uh, the God of Wisdom shorthand is two thirds. And so he's two thirds man. And as you know, we have two thirds of the standard Babylonian version. Now he's at the beginning of the epic, he's a tyrant. He's a bit like Attila the Hun and Stalin all rolled into one, isn't he? Oh yes. He is not a good king at all. And in fact, for most of the epic, he really gives a good case study in how not to be a Mesopotamian king, because we do know from other sources that if you're the king, you're meant to basically be the mediator between the humans and the gods. Oh, that's the king's job, is it? That's the king's job. It's a really important job because the humans and the gods need to be getting along for cosmic order. But Gilgamesh is much more interested in oppressing his subjects. So it's said that he keeps the sons away from their fathers, the daughters away from their mothers, brides away from their bridegrooms. So instead of going to the king to get help from the gods... You instead see the people circumnavigate the king and they go straight to the gods. To complain about him? To complain about him and say, can you do something about this guy? He is awful. And what do the gods do about this? Well, they make this plan and so they decide that they're going to create an equal for Gilgamesh. Someone is said to soothe the storm in his heart and that's going to be Enkidu. So the mother goddess Aruru takes a ball of clay, she throws it into the wild And from that, Enkidu is born, the wild man. And what is Enkidu the wild man like once he comes into being? Look, he's quite lovely when he starts out. He gets a little bit, when he starts hanging out with Gilgamesh, he gets a little bit more sharp-edged. But at the beginning, he runs with the animals. He, you know, uh, protects the herds from hunters. And he just lives his life hairy, unclothed, having a great time. What does Gilgamesh do when he hears about Enkidu the wild man? Uh, Well, Gilgamesh is intrigued. Uh, He hears about him from the hunters who are frustrated by Enkidu, uh, stopping them from being able to make their catches. But he also hears about him from his mother because Gilgamesh has these prophetic dreams that tell him that Enkidu is coming. Ninsun, Lady Wild Cow, Gilgamesh's mother. Lady Wild Cow. She is very, very capable uh, at interpreting dreams. And so she tells Gilgamesh that his, you know, true love is coming and that he's going to save him. Well, what does he do about this then? How does he then go about uh, dealing with this Enkidu? Well, we've heard that um, Enkidu is frustrating the traps of the hunters in the woods. What, he's releasing animals from traps? He's releasing animals from traps. So Gilgamesh sets a trap and what he uses for bait is the priestess that you mentioned before, Shamhat, who works at the Temple of Ishtar. And Shamhat, her name comes from the Akkadian word Shamahu, which means superlative beauty and fecundity. Um, And so that's basically her whole uh, description. She, she's this beautiful, wise woman and she goes into the forest and she's meant to lie down and entice Enkidu to have sex with her. How does she do that, may I ask? Uh, they're quite clear about it in the text. <laughs> there's, all, there's all these descriptions uh, saying that she needs to, you know, raise her skirts and basically open her legs. So, yes. and, and so that's when they have sex. For, for how long? Well, initially it was thought for a whole week A whole week. A whole week. But then recently (laughs) they found another tablet that suggests that it's actually two whole weeks. Two whole weeks they have sex together. Mm. Is this presented as some kind of sacred act, this priestess offering sex to Enkidu? It's a good question. In the text it sounds more like they're just having a nice time. Right. However, it definitely changes Enkidu because when he's finished having sex with Shamhat, he sees his hurt and he wants to get up and go and run with them like he normally does but he finds that he's lost his strength and he can't chase after the herd like he used to. Also, he now speaks Akkadian, uh, so she somehow managed to teach him all of the language Um, and he is really ready to become further civilised. There's so many metaphors like this in the Bible too, aren't they, of the idea that in in having language, Mm. as humans get language, it makes them civilised, but it means they lose the pleasure of living like a wild creature. Indeed. And it's this idea of the woman as the civilizer as well that oh, we yes. see in so many texts. Like Eve handling the apple, apple. from the tree of knowledge to, to Adam. Yeah. Um, but as you say, he gets, he gets alienated from his wild man origins and for the rest of his life he will be homesick for the wild. So how then is he brought into the company of Gilgamesh. Well, he's having a chat with Shamhat and they were talking about uh, how fabulous the city of Uruk is. And she describes Gilgamesh and his tyranny. And Enkidu is 
uh, he has a sense of justice and he doesn't like the idea of Gilgamesh throwing his weight around. And so he says, I'm going to go and I'm going to challenge him boldly. And Shamhan is like, please don't, because the gods favour him. They'll send prophetic dreams, letting him know that you're coming. He'll crush you. And Enkidu, obviously, he just sees that as more of a challenge. And so Shamhat takes him to Uruk, where he runs into Gilgamesh, who is hurrying to, you know, enact more tyranny. Uh, he's on his way to uh, crash a wedding night, but instead he finds... So when you say crash a wedding night, you mean to take the bride from the groom on the wedding night? Yes, it's that whole right of first night thing that we see uh, throughout history at uh, various places where the king has the first night with the new bride. Uh, but Enkidu is having none of it. And so he goes, steps in front of the threshold and forbids Gilgamesh from entering. And Gilgamesh has never really been forbidden of anything before. And so obviously he attacks Enkidu and they have a really big fight that basically uh, puts cracks in the walls and they're rolling around and they're very evenly matched because the wild man, he's strong, he's hairy, um, and Gilgamesh being two-thirds divine. But they've realised that they're so well matched that they just suddenly become friends. More than friends? More than friends. Lovers? <laughs> Towards the end in Tablet 12, there is some suggestion about them having a sexual relationship and we can see that in other texts as well. It's amazing. It's kind of like a, um, it's a, like an epic bromance with a bit of romance. <laughs> Ninswin adopts Angadu, so he becomes Gilgamesh's brother. And this is very Mesopotamian. If you have a really close relationship... It's got many different dynamics to it. They're like blood brothers now, They're essentially. They're like blood brothers. And uh, the, the idea of the story is that they love each other more than anyone loves anyone. and broadcast. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler. You can find more conversations anytime on ABC Listen app or go to abc.net.au slash conversations. How is their relationship depicted, the relationship between Gilgamesh and Enkidu in this epic, Louise? Uh, it's presented in a really uh, sophisticated way, uh, using a lot of imagery. Uh, they're often said to be sort of holding each other. They support each other, but also a lot of the imagery that they use is kind of the imagery you would expect for, say, a husband and wife. When Enkidu dies, uh, Gilgamesh is said to cover his face like a bride. Uh, and his mother says that he's going to love him like a wife. So when they're together, they're, they're very happy. But Enkidu, does he miss his life as a yes, wild man? he does. He still pines for the wild, even though Gilgamesh is his true love. His heart is a little bit torn because he misses his old life. And so Gilgamesh comes up with this fabulous idea. He's like, let's not sit around being sad. Let's go and hunt a monster. <laughs> <laughs> Of course. Of what, course. What, what do we do? But that, I mean, a monster could be a metaphor for any kind of thing. Really, I, Who's this monster they're going to go and kill? Uh, this is Humbaba, who in Sumerian sources is called Huwawa. And he's this amazing monster figure with like a sort of, he has like a grinning kind of mask that was used as an apotropaic kind of water off of evil in the ancient world. So people would actually stick his head, plaques of his head around. It's said that the blood on his tongue never pales uh, and that his speech is the deluge and his breath is death. Uh, and so he's basically just kind of this terror of a figure. Does he have some magical ability to inspire terror? He has the seven auras of terror, which he can send out against people and make them basically unable to move because they're so frightened. So where do they go to find this Humbaba, the monster? Well, they have to travel a really long way away. That's one of the things that you see in Epic is that if you want to find something fantastic, you tend to have to go a long way away from the city. It's a quest. It's an odyssey. Yes. It's an odyssey and it takes them a long time to get there, uh, but they have to go to the cedar forest. And it's really interesting because Humbaba, he again is presented with great complexity because on one hand, he's a monster, but on the other hand, he's a sacred figure. So the gods, uh, particularly Enlil, uh, they love him. Oh, is he like the guardian of this cedar forest then? He is. He's the guardian, guardian and also 
he's presented in the text as being almost like the king of the cedar forest. And so it's almost like Gilgamesh and Enkidu are attacking a foreign kingdom and killing its king. Now, cedars are found in the eastern Mediterranean, aren't they? Isn't that like the symbol of the flag of Lebanon? Yeah. So, so can we imagine that they're telling a story of them going to the, the Mediterranean or something or to Syria or to Lebanon, what is now the states of Syria and Lebanon? Uh, it's thought to be around Mount Lebanon. When Gilgamesh and Humbaba finally come to blows, it's said that it was such a, a powerful shock the force of their two bodies that it actually opens up the Bacar Valley uh, that separates the mountains of Lebanon. I've had people tell me that apparently there's evidence of anthropogenic deforestation. When you say that man-made deforestation? Yeah, in sort of the forests around, the cedar forests around Lebanon from around sort of around 7000 BCE. Interesting coincidence, isn't it? Yeah. So this might, this might possibly be a tale of uh, of how humans destroyed the forest. And is the forest destroyed in this fight? It is. Well, not in the fight, unfortunately, because they have to kill the forest guardian first and then they chop down all his trees as the mm-hmm. final insult. Why do they chop down the trees? So there's this beautiful scene which has only been rediscovered in the past uh, 10 years. Uh, they get to the forest and sort of a hush descends on the forest because there's these outsiders there. But the forest is described as being this incredibly beautiful place with like the resin sap dripping off like rain out of the cedars. And Gilgamesh and Enkidu are entranced by the beauty of the forest. And so they can really appreciate its aesthetic value, but they can also appreciate its economic value. And so they decide that they want to chop down the trees and basically harvest them for themselves. Wow. The modern analogies are really, really powerful here, yeah. aren't they? <laughs> yeah. oh, this is so beautiful, but we need the money. Yeah, so exactly. that's it? That's it. Yeah. Well, yeah, so they have this fight with Humbaba and uh, Gilgamesh, he does get terrified at one point, but then Shamash, the sun god who favours the Mesopotamian king, comes and sends all these winds to his aid, his 13 winds. They name them all. I won't. Um, <laughs> but then... Enkidu gets frightened as well. And Gilgamesh turns around to him and says, forget death and chase life. And I always like to think of that when I'm teaching as being the world's first heroic catchphrase. It's like I'll be back or something, but in Mesopotamia. Forget death and chase chase life. life. Right. (laughs) Wow. So, so So they kill the monster. They kill Humbaba, but before they kill him, he curses them. And he says that um, he asks that Shamash makes sure that nobody but Gilgamesh buries Enkidu. And so that means that Enkidu will never have a family of his own. So Gilgamesh and Enkidu have killed Humbaba, Mm. the monster of the forest, and they've chopped it all down. What happens when they go back to Uruk, the city of Gilgamesh? Gilgamesh decides to have a bath and he's cleaning his weapons and along comes the beautiful goddess of love and battle, Ishtar. And she sees him, she falls in love with him and she wants to marry him. So far, so good, right? Because in Mesopotamian religion, uh, the goddess was meant to be involved with a sacred marriage with the king and prosperity ensued for all. And so you're thinking, okay, this is going to work. But then Gilgamesh turns around and not only does he turn her down, but he turns her down so rudely. He knocks back the goddess of love, does he? He sure does, in harshly unflattering terms. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. He's going to pay a price for that then. He says that she's like a drafty back door and what? like a faulty battering ram and like a shoe that bites the foot of its owner, mm. which is actually particularly insulting because in ancient Mesopotamia, the abrasion from an ill-fitting sandal was thought to be a deadly omen. He says that to the goddess of love yeah. and war. So, so what does she do once she's been ins- knocked back and insulted like that? Well, I probably should have mentioned that Ishtar is the goddess of love and war and also vengeance. And so <laughs> she's not going to take this lying down. She goes up to see her father in heaven and says, Oh, father, give me the bull of heaven so that I can bring it back down to earth and destroy Gilgamesh. Arn is like a little unsure that this is the way to go. He's trying to be the voice of reason. He's like do you want to just think about this for a little while? And if it comes down to earth, it's going to be a big disaster. And she's like, it'll be fine. So they bring the bull down to earth and straight away there are sinkholes, there are earthquakes, people are swallowed up in the sinkholes. It's a disaster. What is this bull of heaven? It's actually the constellation Taurus. Amazingly, the Mesopotamians see a giant bull pretty much where we do. And so she leads that down out of the stars and he is like Gilgamesh in that he's part animal, but also part supernatural. There's something about him that's just outsized. He's the size of the city, practically. And so you've got this massive bull 
and Enkidu and Gilgamesh have to do battle with it. What happens when they do battle with it? Well, for a moment it looks like things are going to be uh, not ending so well for them, but they're able to subdue it and finally kill it. They cut off its haunch and they throw it at Ishtar. And Enkidu says, I'd do the same to you if I could. So having killed and dismembered, uh, dismembered the, the, the bull of heaven, that doesn't sound like a thing you ought to do. Mm. What becomes of Gilgamesh and Enkidu after that? They go and have a big feast. But Ishtar, like Humbawa, has cursed them. And Enkidu wakes up a few nights later having had a terrible dream that the great gods have gotten together and have decided to punish them. And what happens to Enkidu? Well, the gods decide that one of the two heroes will have to die as punishment for killing these two sacred creatures and insulting Ishtar. Uh, And because the gods favour Gilgamesh, Enkidu is going to die. So he becomes very, very sick. And he lies on his deathbed. And while he's there, he decides to curse everything that moves. So he curses the cedar from the forest. He curses the trapper that discovered him. And he curses Shamhat that led him to civilization. What kind of vision does he have of the afterlife that awaits him? It's a very dark vision. So he sees a world of dust and shades awaiting him. A and, world of dust. Yeah, and he it doesn't um, it doesn't appeal. He doesn't want to die. Um, but Shamash, the sun god, comes and talks to him, and comforts him and says that when he dies, his beloved Gilgamesh will put forward all these funerary rites and will mourn for him, and puts it in the frame of the fact that the love that he has had with Gilgamesh gives his life meaning. How does Gilgamesh react once Enkidu finally dies? Oh, it's very heartbreaking. He just doesn't quite understand. And it's said that he he's goes to Enkidu and he says, what sleep has seized you? And he tries to lift his head and get a response, but he can't get any response. And so he listens for his heartbeat and he can't hear anything. And he finally realises that Enkidu is no more. So there's terrible grief there. Terrible grief. But there's something else as well, isn't there? There's a kind of an existential panic too. Yes. He sees what happens to Enkidu and he realises that he doesn't want to die. Uh, And so he decides he needs to find a cure for his own mortality. Even though he's two-thirds divine, that one-third that's mortal makes him completely susceptible to death. So what does he do? What quest does he go on then to try and find the secret of eternal life? Firstly, he uh, takes off all his clothes and goes and fights with a bunch of lions and dresses himself in a lion skin. What, like Hercules? Pretty much. (laughs) This predates the story of Hercules too, doesn't it? Yes, people have thought that there might have been some sort of uh, literary lending from Gilgamesh to Hercules. Wow. (laughs) Obviously, they're both associated with solar deities as well. And I just remember that there's a lot of references, having read the the epic, to Gilgamesh wielding a bat. Yes, As well, like Hercules, like a club. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It really does seem an obvious um, origin point for the the legend of Hercules, doesn't it? Indeed, yeah. So once he's defeated the lions and puts on the lion skin, Mm. where where does he go? Well, he's heard rumours that the flood survivor, the legendary flood survivor, Utanapishtim, may hold the key to eternal life, but he lives uh, far, far away from civilization. Nobody is thought to be able to reach him in this faraway place. But Gilgamesh sets out uh, and he goes and he has to firstly uh, go through the path of the sun, which is guarded by the fearsome scorpion people, uh, but they let him pass. And then he gets to the jeweled forest, which is a really interesting part in his character development because you saw how he, how he responded to the cedar forest. He chopped it all down and then he gets to the jeweled forest where actually the trees are made of lapis lazuli and all the fruit are jewels. And he looks at them, he admires them, he keeps moving. He leaves them alone. He leaves them alone. But he does meet the beer goddess there, Saduri. The goddess of beer? Indeed. And she suggests that he can't succeed in his quest and that he should instead go home. Obviously, Gilgamesh isn't going to take that on board. That's just the beer talking. (laughs) Yeah. Nice. (laughs) And so he presses on and he goes and meets uh, the boatman, Urshanabi, and his stone ones, which seem to be like a bunch of oarmen that are made out of stones. Gilgamesh looked like he was showing some wisdom when he passed by the Forest of Jewels, but when he meets the stone ones, he can't help himself and gets into a big fight and smashes them all. 
And so then they were the only people that were meant to actually be able to cross the waters of death, which are going to take him where he needs to go. And so he and Oshinabe develop the skill of sailing. And they sail across the waters of death. And he finally, finally reaches the shores where he meets Utanapishtim. Utanapishtim is the man who, the one man who survived the Great Flood. Is he like an avatar of Noah then, is he? He is a flood survivor like Noah. Uh, and I should say um, that like Noah, his wife is also the survivor of the flood. But we don't get her name, I don't think. What story does he tell about the Great Flood? He tells an amazing story all about how the gods created humans to do their menial tasks, but the humans became too populous and made too much noise. And so Enlil, the storm god, whose name means Lord Wind, he decides to get rid of all the people and he has a couple of goes at it, but each time the god of wisdom, Ea, stops him. Finally, he decides to send a great storm, which is going to create the flood. And he makes all the gods swear that they can't tell anyone. And I'm sure he's looking at Ea and going, especially you. But Ea has managed to get around it by going to his favourite, Udnapishtim, and instead of telling him directly, he stands outside his house and says, Oh, Wall, I'm very concerned, Wall, about this coming flood. Oh, if only Udnapishtim would build a boat and preserve himself and his family. Right. He's not telling Utanapishtim this. He's just no, no, saying no. it to the wall just... where, and who knows who's going to overhear this. <laughs> exactly. He can't tell. But it is overheard by Utanapishtim. It is. It's very Pyramus and Thisbe kind of moment, I feel. Yes. And, and so he's, he's told to build a boat. Mm. And are there really specific instructions, like however many cubits <laughs> by however many cubits, that kind of instruction? Um, there are some quite specific instructions and there's quite detailed accounts with the boat building, which again, very much parallels what we see in Genesis. And is he asked to bring animals aboard? Uh, he is indeed asked to preserve life and to forget his riches. And so Utanapishtim builds the boat, and the first thing he does is fills it with gold and silver. <laughs> right. But then he puts on animals of all kinds and trades people of all different kinds and his family, and then they seal it up, and then the storm comes. And the waters rise. The waters rise, and everything turns black. And then when the flood waters recede, where is this boat left? Uh, well, the boat is left adrift, and it looks like everything has been destroyed. But Utnapishtim has this idea that he'll send out some birds to see if there's anything left for them to perch upon. Good Lord. He starts with a dove. He sends out a dove first and then he sends out a sparrow and then finally a raven. And when the raven doesn't return, he realises it's safe to disembark. So this story does sound, of course, awfully similar to the Genesis story of Noah and the Great Flood, and this is what, of course, created such enthusiastic interest. But this mm. does precede the story from the Bible, doesn't it? It does. Uh, so we have earlier texts of um, the Gilgamesh Flood story than we do of the biblical account. Uh, and also uh, the Gilgamesh story contains Atrahasis, which is the older Mesopotamian flood story, which is even older than Gilgamesh itself. Uh, and then there's the knowledge that we have that the Gilgamesh story was widely known across the ancient um, world and they have found tablets of it in modern day sort of Israel, Palestine. So might we expect it would certainly be possible for the author or authors of the book of Genesis mm. would have been aware of the story of Gilgamesh? Yes. So is Utanapishtim then, he survived the Great Flood and he's immortal now as well. Yes, he and his wife are granted immortality by the gods who also swear not to flood the world the same way again. Right, <laughs> they've learned their lesson. <laughs> okay. So Gilgamesh then has travelled all this way. Yes. To find Napishtim, mm. the one man who can live forever. And is he able to give Gilgamesh the secret of immortality? Sadly, no. Uh, because the gods have promised not to flood the world the same way again, no one can ever attain immortality the way that Utnapishtim and his wife did. It's a one-time deal. Well, what can he do for Gilgamesh? Very little. And so what he decides to do, he and his wife take pity on Gilgamesh and they say, well, look, we can't make you immortal, but maybe we can make you young again. So there's this herb that is able to renew your youth, but you'd have to swim right deep down into the depths of the ocean to get it. So Gilgamesh then straps some stones onto his ankles, swims all the way down to the bottom of the ocean, finds the plant, it's the heartbeat plant or Amadinu plant, and he thinks, I don't want to try this yet. I'm going to take it home to Uruk and try it on someone who's really old and make sure it works before I try it myself. Very smart. Mm. And so then he decides to have another bath 
And while he's having a bath, a snake creeps up on him, takes the herb, swallows it, slithers off while shedding its skin. Oh, it's become young again. It's become young again. It's an, it's an origin story for how snakes shed their skin and sort of have that rebirth quality. He's lost this plant, the, the plant that will make him youthful again. Yeah. Can he go back and get another one? <laughs> <laughs> Look, I it's another think, one-time deal, is it? Huh? Well, I feel like he possibly could, but he doesn't. He's kind of like, oh, well, I can sort of see that maybe that's not meant to be. And instead, he and the boatman, Urshinabi, they just turn around and head on back to Uruk. So he's lost his, his dearest friend, his mm. lover, Enkidu. He can't live forever. Mm-mm. He's lost the... The herb of youth. Yeah. What becomes of him in the end? Well, it's a little bit of a mystery because they get back to uh, the uh, walls of Uruk in Tablet 11 and you would kind of expect some kind of scene summing things up and explaining to us what it all means, but instead you just have Gilgamesh pointing out the walls to Urshanabi and saying, look at how strong the foundations of the city are, look how beautiful the city of Uruk is, and he's very proud of the city. People have sort of wondered what this all means, but Andrew George sort of talks a little bit about how Utan Pishti tells the story of the mayfly that lives, we know mayflies live for like one or two days, but the river that they live on lasts forever. And so Andrew George says that what Gilgamesh is saying that is that even though humanity is mortal, humankind is immortal. And so the great deeds that we do together can live on which is why it's really interesting for us to be reading these 4,000-year-old works of literature because even though our individual stories may be limited, there is something about what we have as a culture and a civilization together that is unlimited. You know that idea that Hollywood's been drawing on ever since The Wizard of Oz and Star Wars, which is the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell's idea of the hero's journey. The, yeah. the, the hero gets a challenge. They go out into the world. They go on this great odyssey. They... They go to the Death Star or they go to Oz or whatever Mm. and they defeat a a great evil and the world is set to rights because they're able to bring back some magic elixir. And that elixir can be all kinds of things. And it seems to me here the elixir, magic elixir he's brought back to Uruk is just resignation, knowledge, wisdom, Mm. that Mm. all things pass and he too is doomed to die like everyone else and he's learned to accept that. I think that's exactly right. I think that he does bring back wisdom and I think that his character arc is that he learns to accept his place in the world and his role as the king. Shame all these people had to be killed and a forest had to be felled for him to get there, though, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but it was quite a story. <laughs> it's a wonderful, it's, a, it's an absolutely wonderful story. Is there a lesson to be learnt here or is that just too dumb and too sort of children's fairy tale, like to demand a kind of a lesson at the end of the Epic of Gilgamesh? Or are there things you, can, you want to conclude from it? Hmm. I think that you can take from the Epic of Gilgamesh pretty much whatever you want. And I think that that's what makes it so fabulous. If you like sports, there's wrestling. Wrestling's good. <laughs> Wrestling's cool. If right. you like food, there's like all these feasts and things. If you like giants and monsters, you know, you've got it. it if, if you want a beautiful love story, it's like the world's first incredibly beautiful love story with Gilgamesh and Enkidu. You want an angry goddess? Sure. So... My colleague, Sophus Heller, who has done a new translation of the epic, which is brilliant, uh, he says that the Gilgamesh epic is like a punching bag, that you can just go a few rounds with it and then it's just going to be like, what else have you got? Because it doesn't matter what you throw at it, it's still going to keep you coming back for more because there's just so much going on in this really early work of literature. There's a kind of a bit of a trend you can see, I think, in if you sort of look at the stories that are told, at the beginning of a civilization, at the end, at the end mm. of a civilization, and we know from the different versions we have of the Epic of Gilgamesh, we have the, the first earliest one, versions that were written four thousand years ago, and then the later ones that were written three thousand years ago, the more modern versions, mm. and it changes over time, doesn't it? It sort of begins as a bit of a hooray for superheroes sort of type journey at the start, and at the end, it's much more pessimistic. It's a, it's about being resigned to death, being resigned to the transience of all things. This is it seems to be like a model you can follow throughout so many human civilizations. What do you think about that? Do you think this might apply here? I agree. And I think that it is really interesting, the old Babylonian version, there's much more focus on what an exceptional king Gilgamesh is. But then the standard Babylonian version is more focused on his search for wisdom and death becomes a major theme of the epic. Um, And Gilgamesh wrestles as much with his own mortal frailty as he does with his outsized adversaries. 
But that being said, in the old Babylonian version, uh, Siduri, the goddess of wisdom and beer, she gets to have a little bit more to say. They, some of her dialogue tends to go to Utanapishtim in the later version. But she says to Gilgamesh that he really needs to forget about trying to live forever and instead he needs to enjoy living for right now and enjoy being with his loved ones, clean clothes, that he should have a party day and night, carpe diem, live in the moment. Um, Gilgamesh, of course, ignores this. But there is some suggestion that this speech from Suduri has had some kind of influence on the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, There's a speech from Kohelet where he says pretty much the same thing. The translation you were talking about there, the, this recent translation by Sophus Heller, I, I have this book too, mm. and it's wonderful. And the, one of the best things about it is there's missing parts to the Epic of Gilgamesh. And where there are missing bits, he's sort of got like dot, 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 and some sort of sort of big open bits of the text where you just where you know how much is missing as well yeah. from, from it. And it's, you can still read it very easily and very enjoyably too. Are, are there remnants that can be deciphered from the old cuneiform? Are there there stone tablets lying around which might offer us these missing bits? Yes, I think there are varying estimates, but at least half a million untranslated cuneiform tablets are, as you say, lying around. There's just not enough Assyriologists. We're a very small field. There's not enough of us in the world to actually translate them. And, you know, as I was saying before, Andrew George, it took him 15 years to put together his translation of Gilgamesh. It's quite painstaking, difficult work. The great Irving Finkel has been on the show several times, yes. the, the seriologist based at the British Museum, is a friend of yours as well. You can both read cuneiform. Yes. As I say, Irving can read it off the, straight off the tablet, Him as I've often said. better than me, yes. <laughs> but nonetheless, how many people in the, world, in the world can read cuneiform, do we think? I think possibly around about 500. I'm working on a new generation at the University of Sydney. Um, but people in the field, uh, like, for example, Enrique Jimenez, are working at teaching computers how to... Maybe not read cuneiform quite yet, but to be able to identify which parts of the fragmented tablets belong together. And they have this project, which is wonderfully called the Fragmentarium, where they get the tablets, they show them to the computer, and it does the puzzling for you. And Enrique has said that what used to take, say, 40 years could now be done in the space of an afternoon. How fascinating. I'm so glad we had this conversation. I've been wanting to have this conversation about the Epic of Gilgamesh with you for some years now, Louise. Thank you so much for telling us the story today. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to a podcast of Conversations with Richard Feidler. For more Conversations interviews, please go to the website abc.net.au slash conversations.